fabulous looking bikes here on the stage, and they're not just here uh, looking pretty, especially not this one. It is special, but it's there for a reason. I'll explain why uh, in just a bit. Um, our next guest, though, will talk more about it, in fact. He, uh, he set up SRAM, which is the world's second largest component company, with his brother, uh, even though he described himself more as a, a mountain biker. We'll forgive him that, because they do make some quite nice uh, road cycling uh, baubles. However, FK's passion is world bicycle relief, hence the bikes on stage with me now. To give you a bit more of an idea of what that is all about, have a look at this. Please welcome to the stage, FK Day. Thank you, Matt. FK, welcome. Welcome to the Ruler Classic. Really good to see you here. Cycling makes the hair stand up on the back of my neck, but that video did the same thing as well. So how did World Bicycle Relief come about? It was 13 years ago or so, wasn't it? Yeah, just about. Like I know all of us uh, use our bikes mostly for recreation or sport or health, fitness, all of that. But about 13 years ago, right after the Indian Ocean tsunami, instead of responding just with money, we tried to rally the bicycle industry together to run a large-scale bicycle program in Sri Lanka, where they really needed for basic transportation. And the impact was so great that we began to replicate it in Africa. Mm -hmm. So that raises the, the hair on the back of my head as, as well. <laughs> Prior to that, it was all about the kit, it was all about the gear shifters and the chain rings and all the other stuff because you set up SRAM with your brother. So tell me how that came about because it was a long time before it really made an impact on road cycling, which most of us are, are massively into. Right, right. So um, my brother and I started SRAM back in 1987 before most of you were born. <laughs> And uh, my brother was a weekend uh, triathlete, and I was a weekend mountain biker. And we lived together in downtown Chicago. And he would come back from training rides and say, you know, I'm going to get killed out there shifting my bike from the down tube. Remember that? Mm -hmm. So our very first product was putting twist shifters on the end of the handlebar called Grip Shift. If you've never seen them, I know why. Because we projected we'd sell 100,000 units our first year, and we only sold like 852 units. <laughs> Big success then. Yeah. How do you bounce back from that and become a big, successful global company? Well, I think back then, we were so confident that we had created the next best thing to slice bread that we went ahead and introduced it before we had showed it to any potential riders. So we fell in love with our product. And what we learned when the product was thoroughly rejected was that the idea was good, but we needed to evolve it. So we listened very carefully. It really taught us humility and how to be a much better listener. And we went out into the marketplace and spoke with racers and, and dealers and everyone in, involved in the industry. And we slowly refined it. So a couple of years later, we began to really take off. Uh, and primarily, as I, as I said in the intro there, it's, it's mountain biking that was hugely your thing. But those of us who you know, watch the tour, watch the races, will be aware of the likes of Contador winning 
on SRAM and how you had a, a big impact in the tour and other big races in the 2000s. Was that always the plan or did you sort of fall into road cycling almost by accident or because you felt you had to? Well, you know, our very first product, that grip shift on the end of the handlebar, that was our first entry into road. Mm. It was thoroughly rejected. And then we began to return to road, I think, in the early 2000s. I think we started off with uh, chains and cassettes, and we got the appetite to really go out and develop the whole group. So we developed mechanical, and we thought mechanical was, mechanical shifting, that is, was superior to electronics. You know, Shimano had come out with the electrics, and we thought, no, mechanical is the way to go. So as Shimano progressed forward, we kind of slid backwards until we found that, wow, maybe electric uh, shifting is a good idea. Mm -hmm. So we had to scramble and figure out not just how to match them, but actually how to beat them uh, at that game. And that's where we came up with, uh, with our first ETAP. Hold that thought, because we'll come back to ETAP, and we'll come back to the future in a minute. But it was slap bang in the middle of the 2000s when you were getting into this space that that disaster happened and your focus changed. Why, why did it change? Why did you feel a need to, to do something? Did you feel in some ways a sort of sense of Western guilt that you had all this stuff and you had some success and you wanted to share? What was the motivation for wanting to start what became World Bicycle Relief? Well, back, uh, back then in 2005, um, I was heading up all of SRAM's product development and all we were doing was designing for the very top of the market. But I saw all this talent surrounding us, and I knew that we could do anything we set our minds to. So when the disaster hit, we were able to you know, change a number of people's uh, uh, workloads within SRAM to focus in on nailing this large-scale bicycle program in Sri Lanka. And as I look at it, I think it's been, it had a huge impact on our culture, because I think I love designing stuff that's at the top of the market. You know, ten, fifteen thousand dollar bikes, twenty thousand dollar bikes. How cool is that? But to be able to create a bike that is one hundred and forty-seven dollars, or about ninety pounds, ninety-five pounds, mm -hmm. that changes someone's life, perhaps saves a life, creates deeper meaning for the whole process, the high end and the low end. So I feel deeply gratified to that. So this is the Buffalo bike. Um, Pretty sturdy, not too expensive. About 55 pounds of love. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. you'd have to love it, wouldn't you, um, at that weight. But the point is, it's not for weight weenies. It's not about that. It's about accessibility. And, and it's about, well, it has to be sturdy, right? So tell us a bit more about the bike. Yeah, well, you know, if we look at this bike here, you know, every single piece of that bike, at least for, as far as the components go, they were like designed with very specific uh, intention. That would be you know, speed and weight and, and all of that. Designing for the top of the market is identical to designing for the very bottom of the market. Just the user's brief is different. So we need to design every component on that bike to be durable, reliable, repairable, and inexpensive all at once. So we don't have to worry about expense on this type of bike. But on that type of bike, you do. If we had spent a thousand bucks, or had, if that bike cost a thousand bucks, it wouldn't be making the difference in, for, in developing countries the way this bike is mm -hmm. right now. But every single piece of this thing, uh, I could tell you a little story about every single piece. Yeah, we probably haven't got time for that because it's, there's quite a lot of pieces on the bike. Um, how has it all evolved then? And how many people have you helped? And where are you helping people? Yeah, so most of our work is in, uh, is in Africa, but we've also done work in Southeast Asia and uh, in South America. And we've delivered, I believe, about over 425,000 bikes so wow. far. Wow. And um, they mostly go into areas of healthcare, education, or economic development. And what's really interesting is that if we, if we put a bike into a healthcare initiative, the economics in that household improve, and the education in the household improves. So this bicycle is such a, it, it cross cuts like so many different areas, it helps in so many different areas that we don't even think about it, because we have so many transportation choices, we don't, we don't think about how important it would be if your only choice was walking and suddenly a bike entered into your life. What is the buzz like? How, how does the buzz compare seeing someone on one of these bikes compared to a Grand Tour winner racing SRAM? Is one greater than the other? Uh, they're, they're both 
equally great. But I must say that watching a young girl fighting for her education and having that bike tip the balance of that fight that is intensely gratifying. Yeah, I can imagine. I bet you've got loads of stories of people using these bikes for various things and various life-changing reasons, whether it be educational health or, or other things. Um, and 70% of your bikes go to girls. To segue on from the conversation we were just having with you know, female racers, this right. is an important thing to get more girls in parts of the world cycling where things like that are not the norm. Right, right. You know, in, um, in developing countries, there's so many studies out there that say if if you can educate a girl student, amazing things happen not only in the family, not only to her future family, but also to the community. So we focused a lot of our attention on trying to provide these bikes to the education of girls. And the results are, are off the charts. You know, performance is up, absenteeism is down, uh, you know, the households are healthier, um, you know, kids get married later. Someone, someone came up to me and and said, this is, this is when we first started doing the education programs, and goes, FK Day, pregnancies are down. And I'm going, oh, geez, <laughs> what did we do? <laughs> and they were measurably down just because the girls were able to stay in school longer. And that made all the difference. It gave them the confidence. It taught their families that they were more valuable as an educated part of the family yeah. than as uh, someone sold, or not sold, um, married off to, to a neighbor. Yeah, because here they say that happens because men ride on the wrong kind of saddle, but you know, I'm glad, gl <laughs> glad to hear it's different in other parts of the world. Um, there are other programs in the UK that do similar-ish things about getting bikes to, to the developing world, sending bikes to Africa in particular, but what is the difference between what they do and uh, what World Bicycle Relief does? Yeah, I've, I've, I've heard of several, and you know, many are a lot different. We spend a lot of time on the ground in, um, in Africa, studying you know, the bikes that are currently used, the supply chain of spare parts, um, the knowledge base to repair bikes. And we found that we had to design a bike literally from scratch to serve that end user's needs. About, I would say, 80 years ago, the bikes that were going down into Africa were, were probably quite good, you know, built off the old British Roadster yeah. model with the upright handlebars and the 28-inch wheels. And over time, they slowly became degraded. And my belief is that the suppliers became detached from the marketplace. And if you're detached from the marketplace, the only way you can compete is on price. So they kept driving the price out of those bikes until the bikes no longer functioned. So we had to take it from the other way around and design it from the top down so that the bike achieved what the end users needed and try to do it at a cost that they could afford. So we run both philanthropic programs with the bikes and also social enterprise programs with the bikes. And the other bike is on stage because of its money-raising potential. So I mean, it's in stark contrast to the Buffalo bike there. Let me just explain a little bit about it. It is a specialized bike. I think it is a tarmac. It is designed by or facilitated by a couple of guys called Romance who are based in London, but they uh, commissioned the Spanish artist Felipe Pantone to design it in his, what is his uh, sort of textbook um, uh, finish there. And that is a one-off. And that is going to be auctioned to help World Bicycle Relief. How is that going to happen? How can I bid on it? Is it my size? I'm not even, not even sure. Maybe it is. Uh, I think it is. Yeah, it's it my size. Yeah, of course it is. It's yeah. everyone's size. What a stupid question that is. Um, how can people bid on that? And how much of a difference is it going to make? Well, just out of the, I mean, I reflect on the amazing generosity of uh, romance and specialized and the artists who have created this. Uh, I heard that there was seven months worth of painting done on this bike to, uh, to get it to look this way. So um, it is going to go up for auction, and uh, I think it'll be over a period of several days. I believe uh, Sotheby's has uh, valued the bike at $35,000. Now, they're probably not bike guys within Sotheby's, Sotheby's <laughs> that are you know, giving us that information, but it's a beautiful bike. All the proceeds, all the proceeds get donated to World Bicycle Relief to help put these bikes in the hands of school students, which to me is an amazing gift to the students, an amazing uh, bike to have. And I see all of you could own this thing. 
Um, <laughs> if Sotheby's was right, 350 or 35,000 pounds uh, would be about 380 bicycles. Think of the lives that that would change. That's huge. One bike to help so many people. But also hanging off it is your own jewelry in the form of SRAM ETAP. And we got onto that, and we started, we started before we, we digressed and went off and talked about World Bicycle Relief. But it's interesting, isn't it? You mentioned that Shimano and Campagnolo went off on an electric route with DI2 and with EPS. Were you sitting there thinking, we really have to do something electronic? Or did you think, I'll just let them get on with it, and I'll do my thing over here? Well, classically, we were confident that electric wasn't going to take off, yeah. that you know, the, the cyclist wanted uh, mechanical. So we felt very confident, and slowly our confidence waned as uh, we saw the popularity, and we began to get a better understanding of what the, you know, what the feature and benefit stack up is of having electronics. Because others had tried it. The Mavic had tried it, of course, back in the day, and that never worked. In fact, it was malfunctioning left, right, and center. Right. So did you think the same would happen with Shimano and Campac? We, we figured that they'd probably, at least for Shimano, we figured they'd, they'd probably do a pretty good job on it. <laughs> and, um, but we, we didn't think the market would take it up as quickly as it did. Yeah. So then when we saw the market really, really liked it, uh, we, had to, we really had to you know, light the jets and, and get after it. And as we studied, it was like, wow, they've got a lot of features and benefits stacked up in their, uh, you know, their Dure stuff. And we, we just had to figure out how to beat it. And I, I might be biased, but I think we did. <laughs> because those who don't know, and I don't know if you've, any of you, has anyone tried riding ETAP? Does anyone have a bike with ETAP on it here? Yeah, yeah, a couple of you. Because the shifting is different, isn't it? So you, one lever is up the cogs, one lever is down, and together, then you move from the big ring to the small ring. Right. It's pretty simple, up, down, don't think about it. Was that an important thing for you to do? It's quite, quite simple. And it's, more, it's, it's simpler to use than both Campag and, uh, and Shimano as well. Yeah, it's, it's, you know, all, all of our studies say that people get it almost instantly. And um, the beauty is that not only do you get it, and it becomes intuitive quite quickly, but the setup is so easy. You know, bolt it onto the bike, mate the components, and it's done. Mm. You don't have to run wires or anything of like that. It's pretty, pretty fun. Because the shifters talk wirelessly to, uh, to the derailers uh, front and back. Right. When it first came out, there was talk about people somehow driving alongside you and controlling your bike remotely. Did that ever happen? Was that ever a concern? You know, it, it, we, it was a big concern. So we spent a lot of time uh, trying to uh, test and fool the system, try to cause it to malfunction. And we created a protocol, and I, I've, got to, I've got to remember the numbers. It was so long ago that, you know, there was like 100,000 different attempts you would have to make at causing a malfunction. And our system had a unique way to link it up. So we drove all over the country with a machine that had like a hundred of these things set up inside of it, just shifting constantly and, and testing. We put these in the US and Europe and drove them by power plants and drove them into, uh, what is that place in the desert in the US? Uh, uh, Section 21 or something? Oh, Area 51. That one. So, so you let aliens try the bike is yeah, what you're yeah. saying. Okay. No, no <laughs> malfunction. So we, we were really very concerned about it. and. Um, uh, but I, I think we nailed it. What about something as prosaic as just charging the battery? Now, I, I do ride a bike. I, I've got one with EPS and one with DI2. I'm a spoiled boy. Uh, but on both of those bikes, I've forgotten to charge them. And I've been stuck out in the sticks, and suddenly it drops to the small ring. You think, oh, I'm such an idiot. You know, 2,000 miles later, I forgot to plug the damn thing in, which is a ridiculous problem for a bicycle to have. But how does that apply to, to ETAP? You know, batteries have to be charged, but one of the nice things here is that the batteries are interchangeable between the front and the rear. So if by chance you forget to charge the front and you really want to put the rear battery on the front, you can, you can make that work and vice versa. So it's, it's a little easier than having a single battery that has to run both. Yeah. It's yeah. got a little redundancy. We had a hands up for ETAP. Who remembers Dynamo um, lights? Yeah, I thought, I thought a few more people would. You know where I'm going with this. When is there going to be an electric bike that powers itself like a dynamo does? You wouldn't have to put batteries in. Surely the kinetic 
energy will drive the batteries that can you know, facilitate your gear changes. Is that something you're looking at? That sounds like a great idea. Yeah. Um, it's copy, it's, it's trademarked, it's my, it's my yeah, idea. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> we'll, we'll send you the royalties. Um, I think it's totally plausible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Interesting idea. What else are you looking at then in terms of developing uh, your electronic and wireless shifting? Well, we're, we're dead focused on making the ride experience better for, for riders. Mm -hmm. And um, there are so many great ways to do it. I think we have all, Shimano included, you know, the bike brands included, the, the manufacturers have brought this so far, but there's still so much more that we can do. Mm. So I'd have to walk around and have everyone sign non-disclosure agreements. <laughs> uh, but just know we are, we are deeply committed and we feel like we've just begun. I'm going to ask, even though it sounds like a bit of a stupid question, but could wireless brakes ever really be a thing? Yes, you're yes. looking at that. Oh, okay, okay. I've got an NDA yeah. here. I'll sign. I'll sign. Yeah. You, can, you, can, you can share it with me. Okay, I just have one more question. I don't know if you're going to answer it or not. What does FK stand for? <laughs> uh, Frederick King. Okay. I was named after my grandfather, and everyone called him FK, so now I'm FK. FK Day. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Indeed, Matt. Good stuff. Okay, look, as. As FK uh, exits the stage and leaves a 35 grand uh, bike behind, uh, I'm going to have a go on that in a second, but don't go away, because in a moment we're going to have an exclusive showing of a film about Von 2 that you won't be able to see anywhere else, actually. There'll be a 10-minute cut of uh, a very special film called Return to Mont Ventoux. It'll be on here in just a moment, so I'll see you for that in a minute. 